morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning and welcome to Unity of Madison. Thank you for choosing to spend your time with us, this time with us, whether online or in person, we feel your presence. After the service, we invite you to join us in the Namaste Cafe in the lower level for refreshments. Today we have special refreshments, so please join us down there. Um, so our opening song today, Joy is What We Are. I don't know if we have, we don't have any stuff, so hopefully you remember the words. <laughs> Am I waiting? No? no. Working on it. All right. Okay. All right. Well, I think you'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's more than Great. <laughs> yes. So I want to invite um, Raimi up for our opening prayer. Good morning. Good morning. So I invite you to take a deep breath in and let it out. And we arrive in this present moment with hearts that are wide open to the joy we are, to the love we are, to the peace we are. And as we sit in this precious Sunday service. And if you're watching from home, the same for you. We release these beautiful energies out from our body. They spread to the people who sit with us in this room. They spread out of the church into the city of Madison, through Wisconsin, and all of the world. This beautiful, 
vibration of joy, love, and peace. And we are grateful that we can send love, joy, and peace everywhere. And we know it's because we are spirit and we are blessed. And we say, thank you, and so it is, amen. Thank you, Raimi. And now our congregational song, please join us in Weave. month. Uh, February 5th and the 12th, we will, Barry Roberts will, um, you know, be our speaker, so yay. And for the 19th and the 26th, Reverend Richard will be joining us, but on video. So, hey. hey. Um, and uh, just so you know, today is Reverend Richard's last day in person. But so, <laughs> so we are having a celebration downstairs, not a celebration, uh, obviously, a goodbye, you know, celebration. Um, so please join us and we've got cake, good stuff. So, so join us after the service. And okay, uh, lessons in truth. Uh, they think there's still one more class going on this after, this today after service and after cake, and so uh, please join us downstairs for this last class. And then um, another class coming up starting on Sunday, uh, February 26th, and every Sunday after that until April 2nd. Uh, oh, we have, ooh, wow, yay! So, 
Um, the class is Keep a True Lent by Charles Fillmore is the book. And there are um, books available in the library or that can be purchased through Unity or Amazon. Contact Nancy Keeney with questions. Sign up in the foyer or contact the office. And please don't forget to um, renew your membership. Um, so our annual meeting is on February 19th and to be able to vote at the meeting, you do have to have your membership up to date. So um, there's forms out in the foyer or online. You can still do it online. On Saturday, February 11th, from 1 to 5.30, we're having a sh sh shamanic journeying community gathering and um, led by Jessica Rippenberg, who is our new uh, youth ed uh, coordinator in person. So learn, share, connect, and deepen into your shamanic journeying practice. See the e-blast for more class details and online registration information. And there are many more events um, on the calendar, so please Check out the website and find those. So what's next? Of course, come on up. Hi, we had expected to be able to give, um, give you guys your donor reports by today, but there were some um, problems with the independent donor reports that the accountants sent us. Um, they had not merged the capital campaign donations with the general fund donations, and um, we discovered that Friday. <laughs> um, so what we're hoping is to have those corrected ones available if you're here next Sunday to pick up in person. Anyone who doesn't pick them up next Sunday will be mailing them out to you. If you need them sooner than next week, um, send me an email at treasurer at unityofmadison.org and I can um, send you a, um, an electronic, you know, an email with your donor records. So, um, sorry, we're at least announcing it before January 31st. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks for all your gifts. It was a great year. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and um, so I'm going to welcome, and do we have any newcomers in the audience today? Oh, wow, the three of them. Yay, welcome, welcome. Glad you're here. Um, there are information packets on the table and should go out, so please pick one up. So, but glad you're here, welcome. So, um, and on our office, it, online, if you're wanting information, please uh, contact the website or email office at unityofmadison.org. And so now we have our affirmation, and it's up there, hopefully. Yes? You want to come up? You're, all, you're allowed. Come on. <laughs> and if you said you are not, I would have stayed where I was. <laughs> Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I also would like to welcome everybody here, those of you who are here for the first time. Would you raise your hand again? I didn't see that. My goodness gracious. Okay. Well, thank you for being here, and we hope each of you got a, a packet, as uh, Pat said. And uh, I'd just like you to know that UC of Madison is a place where you can feel safe, where we welcome people who are of different cultures, different races different sexuality, that we are open and we know that each of us, including you, is God's child. Is God's child. So thank you for being here. Thank you. And on the line also. And I suspect we have a few more people in line this morning uh, because winter finally got here the day before I'm supposed to leave. I'm, I'm thankful, in a sense. I, I, I was really kind of anxious because we weren't getting any snow. And, uh, so I thought you guys just made that up, you know? Uh, and January is supposed to be the coldest month of the year and all those kind of things. Well, wait for February, okay? And I'll be gone and I'll be back in warmer country 
but I wish I would be here for that because I love it. Um, the other thing I'd like to do is just share this affirmation with you, and let's do it together now that we have this. Oh, now that we have the screens. Two things. Thank you, guys. You really worked hard on that. Uh, they've been working on it for a good hour and a half. And uh, also, I want to thank Nancy. She said, she didn't say was it was on Friday. She spent just about half the day here trying to get everything straightened out. And uh, we talked, and other people talked, and we did, Nancy decided it just couldn't be done, and it couldn't. So she gave it a gallant effort, and uh, you should be thankful for her. So thank you, Nancy. Thank you. So affirm with me this statement. Together, Unity of Madison is abundantly blessed. Creative people are drawn to us. Divine ideas flow through us. Financial resources bless us. And with God as our source, we accomplish mighty works together because we are in oneness. So now we have this opportunity to take a few moments to greet one another as, as Pete uh, treats us with a song. And, um, and as you greet one another, just remember, you can hug if you want to, but you gotta do this, okay? You can do this if you'd like. Honor the person this way. You can bump hands, shake hands, any of that, okay? And, uh, and a couple of you are pretty rough with that, so please, no, no you're not, I'm kidding, okay? And so now let's go ahead and greet one another this morning. Thank you for being here. everybody out on such a nice snowy day so yeah so um, to, right now it's time for introductions our musicians today is our special music is Joy Morgan and Pete Calguero oh, yeah. and Pete of course is our regular musician here all the time almost all the time so, and our speaker in meditation, of course, is Reverend Richard Bunch. Yay! And our gratitude of the week. So this week, we wish to express our heartfelt gratitude to Reverend Richard. We, you have put a pause on your life to come to our frozen tundra <laughs> and warm our hearts. You brought your lovely wife and adorable puppy to join us during our Christmas season. You have set us on a course of growth. You have, your inspired messages have jump-started our personal practices. You have given us direction and confidence in the right path for us. You have helped the congregation appreciate what we have at Unity of Madison. 
We have been greatly blessed by your presence. We are forever grateful to you, believing in unity of Madison. Know you are always home when you next visit Madison. It's okay. Now it's time for the daily word. Today's word is prosperity. When I think of prosperity, I may think of financial wealth or my possessions. I may even feel tempted to compare my life to someone else's and feel as though I come up short in comparison. Today, my understanding of prosperity grows. Feeling safe and secure in who I am is prosperity. Knowing I am gloriously made in the image of God is priceless. Realizing the abundance of the natural world and partaking of it is a gift. All of these are wonderful reminders I reside in the kingdom of heaven. The more I appreciate the riches of the material world, the more aware I am of my greatest prosperity, my oneness with God. And from Matthew chapter 6, verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And so please join me in our affirmation. I broaden my perspective of prosperity. And now our special music. It's with great thanks that I uh, uh, give Rick, um, accommodation to the office staff for preparing slides today so that <laughs> so, oh, they have to flip through. Um, uh, so that you can sing along. I've done this song for you before, uh, after the probably the first or the second Women's March. Uh, Carrie McKay wrote this in the early 70s when peace, women's peace circles started forming around the United States pre-internet um, because of the Vietnam War and the proliferation of nuclear arms. And um, it's been sung since. And so this is called If Every Woman in the World, and the slides probably are up there, maybe, maybe. Uh, yeah, If Every Woman in the World, please. Um, and join along because some of you were there with me, and um, some of you maybe will learn a new song today. If every woman in the world had her mind set on freedom, if every woman in the world dreamed a sweet dream of peace, if every woman of every nation, young and old, each generation, held her hands out in the name of love, there would be no more war. If every man Set 
a true course for freedom if every nation raised its children in a culture of peace if all our sons and all our daughters reached in friendship across the waters refusing to be enemies there would be Joy, thank you. And how true those words are. And that's why we say we are transformed lives, transforming the world. And that's the truth of it. So this morning, I want to talk about this idea of radical forgiveness. Hmm. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Sorry. There we go. All right. Um, and so anyway... What I want to do is something will be a little different today. Uh, it may set a new idea in motion for you. It may not. Uh, it is a different way of looking at forgiveness. It's called Radical Forgiveness. It's a book by Colin Tipping. He has two or three books, as a matter of fact, out on that. <clears throat> and uh, what I want to do is just say that, first of all, what is forgiveness generally thought of? And <clears throat> what we know is that, anyway, a, a, a <clears throat> The inner child within us can be locked in the past. And what we can understand is that there is this need for forgiveness. But Colin Tippin says, I believe the reason conventional forgiveness takes so long and is so difficult to achieve is that in conventional forgiveness, we are trying to balance two quite opposite and contradictory energies, the desire to forgive and the need to condemn. People are shaking their head, yeah. Okay. Robert Enright and the Human Development Study Group defined forgiveness as not only a decision of a choice to abandon one's right to resentment, guilt and shame, and negative judgments, but an imperative to replace those with compassion, generosity, and self-love. And then another also says forgiveness also involves a compassionate embrace of our love. Well, it's one thing to make a decision at the intellectual level, to give up these feelings, and it's another thing, quite another thing, to actually make it happen. And that's why we're together, to learn how to make certain kinds of things happen so that we find peace and joy and love, and we know who we are, and we're expressing who we are as individuals, as spiritual beings. Remember that compassion, which is forgiveness, arises from the heart, not the mind. Because when it arises from the mind, what happens is that you get into what we would call a pseudo-forgiveness. Pseudo-forgiveness is, I forgive you because you feel like you need to, because somebody told you you should. But I remember what you did. You were wrong, and I still forgive you. <laughs> How many of us experienced that? Huh? Yeah, OK. OK, we got a unanimous vote. Now, the next thing that I want to do is just tell you about some of the assumptions that I am uh, that using in order, and, and that Colin Tipping used, in order to talk about this concept of radical forgiveness. And in a few minutes, I'm going to get to what that is, but I'm going to leave you hanging out for a few minutes, okay? Uh, first of all, is that we have bodies that die, but we are immortal souls that existed prior to our reincarnation and continue to exist after death. So, you and I are immortal. The spirit within us. Sometimes it's called the Christ within. Some the I am within. Some the creative force within me. But there is within each of us this ability to be eternal in nature. And I believe that with all my heart. I can't tell you why. I can't prove it. You know, my daddy told me if anything was out there, he'd come back and tell me. 
and he hasn't said a word since his death. <laughs> so, so anyway, I don't know. But I can make assumptions, and one of the assumptions I make is as a spiritual being, I am eternal, you are eternal. Now, what goes on when we're not here? And radical forgiveness gives some theories on that. But that's the first assumption. The next assumption is that you and I have made an agreement to be here together at this time. Now, this is not predestination. That's not what I'm talking about. I used to be a Presbyterian, but that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> what I'm talking about is that we have made an agreement to play certain roles in one another's lives so that we can do the one thing that's necessary while we're in the human condition, and that is to overcome separation, to understand oneness, to step into the understanding that I am more than my body, I am more than my mouth, thank goodness, I am more than any of those things, I am a spiritual being, and I have eternity to work out whatever I need to work out so I can be in total oneness with everybody. That's a big assumption. I know that, but it's one that makes sense to me. Uh, the other thing that we've agreed to is to be here, and we know that we forget who we are. I told you a few Sundays back about the, the child who, asked, at three years old, asked his mother to go and talk to the new baby and insisted, and finally the parents were a little concerned, but they let her go in, and they kept the little mic on to hear what was going on. And the little fellow looked at her sister and said, tell me what God is like I'm beginning to forget. Oh. Yeah. So, we come in this world, and we forget whatever God is. And we're supposed to because Unless we do, unless we don't, we end up with this idea of separation again. And we end up with this ego that pushes us into supporting that idea that we are separated, we are not one. Also, the pain of separation is an emotional experience. We need a body that has the five senses in order to feel that, express that, be in that. And the human experience is meant to be a, an emotional experience. Now, we make it intellectual, but we men do. <laughs> many of us, not all, but many of us. We make it intellectual. And then finally, somebody comes along, like my wife, and teaches me it is feelings that are important. And being able to express them and share them, even when you're in disagreement, but to do it with love. And so we are spiritual beings having the spiritual experience in the human body. Those are the assumptions I made. Now, what I want to do is share with you a, a story. And uh, I want to show Jill's picture up there, if you would, please. Next one. Okay. That's, this is Jill's story. This is, this is a true story. Uh, Colin Tipping's sister lived in uh, <clears throat> outside of London uh, and came to see him. There were three children, his brother John and himself. John decided to come along for the ride because he happened to be coming from Australia to London to the United States. And uh, so he came along. And it was kind of good that he came along because he could reinforce some of what Colin was he hearing. He said that when Jill got off the plane, he knew because of his sensitivity to her and her sensitivity that something was wrong. She didn't look the same. She wasn't acting the same as they greeted. There was a, a hub, okay? And there was the genuine love, but it didn't feel that way. It was kind of strained. And so he was beginning to wonder, well, I wonder what's going on. And so as they got off the plane and they stayed in London for the first, I mean, in, in uh, <coughs> Atlanta for the first day, so they could look around. And uh, what happened was is that, that Jill said to him the next day, uh, Colin, I think I'm going to leave Jeff. We're going to get a separation. Colin said, what? He said, well, he's, a, he's always been a wonderful guy. He loves you. He's shown his love for you. He's not anymore. What do you mean? Well, the strangest, happened, the strangest thing happened is Lorraine is his daughter. And Lorraine lost her husband. And Jeff, all of a sudden, became very attached to Lorraine. And they would talk in whispers when they were around me. And they would talk about other things, but they wouldn't talk in front of me. And he stopped really showing me any affection and was pouring everything in to support Lorraine. And I just can't handle it anymore. And 
Colin said, okay, I believe what you're telling me. John, is that right? John said, I spent a week there, and it's absolutely right. And Colin said, okay, well, tell me more. And so Jill continues to talk. And she said, you know, um, as you know, I, I was divorced. I had a guy who really, and she said it as a victim, who really took advantage of me. He was a womanizer. And he would go out, and then he'd tell me about it. And that was really cruel. And after three times of that, I said no more, and I left. And so he made me a victim. She used those words. And she said, now, Jeff, well, we've had a great marriage for several years, many years. Now, all of a sudden, it's treating me the same way, I feel like. And I'm a victim to their behavior. Now, hear those words. I am a victim to those behaviors. And... So then Colin talked with her for a couple more days, let her cry, let her talk, let her be. And then after about the third or fourth day of this, he said, I gotta do something, and I wanna introduce a new idea to you, Joe. And she said, well, what is that? He said, well, one of the things you've always mentioned to me is that our dad never showed you any affection, didn't love you, didn't really understand you, was kind of timid with you. And he never held you in your lap. <clears throat> he never did any of those things. And so, <clears throat> here we go, thank you God. Excuse me. So anyway, what happened is, do you remember telling me that story? She said, yes, yeah, uh, I do. And I remember what happened. She said, I saw my dad at a young age. He didn't put me in his lap, he didn't care for me. I figured he didn't love me. Okay, he just didn't love me. Then my mother convinced me a few years later that he couldn't love anybody. He wasn't mean, he was a nice guy, had a great job, intelligent, but he just didn't have the capacity to express his love. And so, Colin said to his sister, Joe, how did that make you feel? And she said, oh, well, I felt like I wasn't enough as a child. I felt like I was not enough for my dad to love me. And she said, when my mother explained it to me, I kind of got, I kind of changed my mind about it a little bit. And then here's what happened. You remember when I was 27 years old, I came back here, and Lorraine, your daughter, was in my father's lap, taking him for a walk. He was joy enjoying it. He was showing that he could love. And she said, I don't know what in the world must have happened. And that, we don't need to be there yet, guys. Come on back. Come on back. Back. That's it right there. Good. Thank you. Everybody was looking at it. I was wondering. <laughs> they don't know what I'm talking about. But anyway, uh, so, so she said, yes. And, and, and he said, so it didn't make you feel like you're enough, right? Yeah. And then it got even worse after I found out that he could love somebody and that Lorraine, what, your daughter, he could show all kinds of affection for now I knew, I knew that I wasn't enough. He said, would you like to explore that from a radical forgiveness standpoint? She said, what's that? He said, well, it's something I've been working on and I believe in fully. And the idea is that each person who's been in your life is there to help you grow. He didn't say this, but I'd say that when Jesus said, Love your enemies and do good to curse you or abuse you or hurt you or make you feel victimized. Love them and appreciate them. And that's a difficult thing to do. So what was Jesus talking about and what is Colin Tipping talking about here? He's saying that the person that appears to be your enemy, the person who appears to be victimizing you, the person who appears to be your persecutor, the person who appears to be in ju in ju the judge in your life, all of that is a human emotion that comes from lack and separation. So what you need to do is now look back and take time, if you're willing to, over the next couple of days, and look back and see uh, how that's happened in your life. And so they began the journey. She talked about her dad again. She talked about how she felt. She talked about her change in feelings and then coming back. And the next time it came back, it was even more forceful. Made her feel even worse. 
And so her first husband, his name was Henry. Henry uh, was a womanizer. And he performed that in such a way as to, I think I may have said this, hurt his wife and tell her about it. And Cotton said, suppose Henry made a contract with you when you were in that place that we don't know where we are, except it's in that space where we know that we are immortal, we know that we're there, we know we've connected, made a contract with you to act out in such a way so that you came to understand what your issue was. She said, you're kidding me. <laughs> and he said, she didn't say it that nicely. And he said, no, I just want you to, you don't have to believe it. I'm not asking you to, I'm just asking the question. And so you don't feel you're enough. And that shows up in your marriage. And Henry, probably by nature being a womanizer, the way he'd been raised, Henry acted that out to let you know that you're not enough. But your role in that is to stop and figure out, what does that mean? Not enough. That's a perception I have as a child. I had it as a three, four, five, six-year-old child, and it's stuck with you. It's a perception that you have grabbed hold of and you believe to be true. But suppose, just suppose you are enough. You know, it's possible, would you say, that maybe Hank wouldn't have acted out the way he acted out? And she thought about it and she said, yes, I think that's possible. He said, now you've got a situation with Jeff. You're thinking about leaving Jeff because Jeff's daughter lost her husband and he's got this bizarre behavior going on. And I understand it is. But is it possible that Jeff is acting this way because you don't believe you're enough and you sold him on the idea you're not enough. She said, well, I have thought of the fact that your daughter's name is Lorraine and how upset I got when I saw my dad showing love to her. And now here is Lorraine, another Lorraine in my life. And, and so I'm making this, I got this understanding that yes, may, maybe that's the case, what's happening here that because I don't feel I'm enough, he doesn't see me as enough, and he is actually acting out, and it could set up the terms for a divorce. And Colin said to her, if you could come to the understanding that you are enough, that you are enough, do you think that would change the way that your present husband is treating you? He said, I don't know. What do you think? He said, I don't know either. But I think it's worth a try. And so over the next week or so, she, he worked with her on this idea of uh, radical forgiveness. And she was really beginning to feel a light had come on. She began to feel light. She couldn't explain it. And so she went back. And when she got back, she said to her husband, Jeff, I don't want to talk right now about what happened while I was away. He said, well, I want to know because I see the difference. And she said, no, I need a little time. You need a little time. I want you to know that although I was really upset with you and you knew it, if you're taking care of Lorraine, I'm no longer upset with you. I'm not judging you. I'm just saying it's happening. And I don't want to talk about it for a couple of weeks. So a couple of weeks went by and Jeff was like, you know, biting his fingernails for her to talk to him. And she looked up at him and she said, I want you to know that I have missed you as my friend and my lover. Jeff started to cry. He said, that's exactly the way I feel. They hugged, they talked, they worked the situation out. Jeff's change, so his his, Jeff's change in the way he was treating his daughter and treating his wife was totally overnight like a miracle. He understood what she was saying, that at the soul level, he had come and made an agreement to act out in such a way so she could understand 
what she perceived was not the truth. Now, I know this is a lot to swallow. And if you haven't read the book, I'd recommend you get it and read it. Because it will make a difference in your life. And by the way, you don't have to believe all the assumptions that I gave. You don't have to agree with them. It'll still work. It will still work if you have the power to understand that somebody's there to help you. Let me give you a personal example. Um, when I was in El Paso, there was a fellow that I had known just as I came into the church and got to know much better, and he was on the finance team. And every month, all he could talk about is the church was going bankrupt. Now, this is a church that had $49 in the bank or something like that when I got there, okay? And I would say, well, I would say something like, well, that's when I thought we were going to go bankrupt. I don't think so now because we have $100,000 in the bank and we own our building now. I don't understand why you're saying that. And then we would get into these uh, disagreements at the finance team meeting, <laughs> which wasn't helpful to anybody, including ourselves. And then what happened is I was studying radical forgiveness, went through the workshops, met with Colin Tiffin about it, and I looked at this fellow, and his name happened to be Richard, too, <clears throat> a reflection. And anyway, I said to him, tell me about what kind of work you've done, what your life's been like. Let's have lunch one day. He said, oh, I'd love to do that. I said, okay. Well, what I found out during lunch was, number one, he owned two businesses, two restaurants, and both of them went bankrupt. <clears throat> and I went, wow. Now I understand why he's worried about it. If I hadn't asked a question about what did you do, tell me a little bit, I wouldn't have understood that. Then all of a sudden, I could see him as my friend. I could see him as somebody who was helping me deal with some issues I had. You know, we all have Lucy's in our lives. Not just Charlie Brown. We all do. Remember Charlie Brown, Lucy said to Charlie Brown, you're an eight ball, can never be sunk. You always try to kick the ball, but you fall on your butt. You are miserable to be around Charlie Brown. And Charlie would just go, okay, fine, yeah, all right. But it bothered him. And she was really setting him up to feel bad about himself. And she knew that because she was pretty smart. Matter of fact, she gave psychiatry lessons for five cents an hour as a young child. So I know she must be brilliant. Well, I've had Lucy's in my life. The first one that I really remember, and it probably goes back further than this, but I was about 22 years old and I went to work for this organization. And uh, I was an executive director, whatever that meant. And, but I had this guy that I worked with who came from the state, and he was a bear. He was a Lucy in my life. And I knew how to really defend myself and figure out that I was a great victim. But I didn't know that then. Those are not words I would use back then because I didn't understand it. And so what happened is, is that uh, all of a sudden, I started to understand this process and understand that the Lucy's in my life were really a perception that I had of myself. I was Charlie Brown. And one of the great, great abilities I had was to be defensive. I could defend anything that came up if I thought it had to do with me. And I've got to tell you, that got me in a lot of trouble. Because that doesn't work. And here's what I would say. I'm not defensive. I'm just letting you know how I feel. Yeah. <laughs> and people, some would laugh. Some would cry. Some would say, that's not true. Look at yourself. And so I was able, for the first time, to really look at myself and all the Lucy's in my life. Because you see, they, they went from the time I was 22, I moved jobs, there was another Lucy. Happened to be my boss. And then the other job, there was another Lucy. I got into ministry, and there's another Lucy. And when you go into ministry, you're not supposed to have Lucy's in your life. <laughs> but there he was, sitting there at the finance team meeting. But when I was able to see that he came into my life to help me, I no longer saw him as an enemy. I no longer saw myself as a victim. 
And that time and that period, I changed, and it took time, but I changed from being defensive to being loving, to be accepting, and to know that each person I met was giving me a message of how they want to help and support me no matter how they showed up. That allowed me to forgive a number of people in my life. And that's radical forgiveness. That's what it is. Being able to understand that you have no enemy. They just look like the enemy because we taught that. Being able to understand that you are pure love. And you know when we feel those ways about ourselves, we don't feel the love. We feel the separation. It's that ability to step into the world from a spiritual viewpoint rather than the picture that the world draws for us. It gives each of us that ability to truly forgive because there's nothing to forgive. Think about that. There is nothing to forgive between myself and anybody because they are there to support me. And I am there to support them. It's no accident that I know you guys. I believe that. Now, if you'd have asked me five years ago that I was going to be at Unity of Madison in the wintertime, <clears throat> I would say, you're a little nuts, aren't you? <laughs> but anyway, but see, I think I was here for a reason. And I believe you're here for a reason. And what you demonstrate so well is the relationship that you have with each other, the love that you have with each other, the appreciation you have with each other. That's what I see and that's what I feel. I didn't need to bring that here. It was already here. I just had some financial things that I need to help you with or remind you of, and you did that too, by the way. I just had the opportunity to let you know that you can grow even after COVID. I had the opportunity to stay with Lori and Helen in their homes and Vicki and Maisie also, and the love that they are and how accepting they were and how much they touched our, my, our lives, all three of us. It was so appreciative. I've had the opportunity to work with a board that is certainly grown into being transparent, of letting you know what's going on in your church. It's not their church, it's everybody's church, it's our church. And I believe that the slate of officers that are coming forth to, uh, not officers, I'm sorry, trustees coming forth, I believe they're picked perfectly for you and for your future. You've got a great future. You've got an opportunity to do great things. As I said last week, I think it was, you are powerful beyond measure. Because you believe in yourself, you love yourself, and you love your neighbor as you love yourself. Radical forgiveness. It's a whole book. I could do more messages on it. I'm not going to take a vote right now. <laughs> but I could do some more messages on it, and I'm thinking about it. Let me know when we're downstairs, or send me an email, and let me know if you want to hear more. But this is the concept behind it. Radical Forgiveness. Radical, let's go to radical forgiveness, please, guys. All the way through. Keep going. We can pray. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Aha, thank you. I'm sorry. But I think you got the picture without a picture. I hope. So, thank you for accepting me just like I am. Thank you for the opportunity to minister to some of you on a personal basis. Thank you for the opportunity to be here each Sunday. And I drove through the snow to get here today. That's good, okay? I liked it. And I just cannot tell you how much I appreciate, how much Vicki appreciates, how much you guys mean to us in a very short period of time. Remember, you are wonderful. You are going to attract the right minister. I'm affirming that. And if it takes longer to find him, it takes longer to find him. But you're going to get the right minister. Somebody who will love you back. Somebody who will be knowledgeable. Somebody who has experience managing church. 
Somebody who believes and knows they are a spiritual being having this experience. Somebody who will love you to death. Thank you, and God bless. So, Pete, would you just give me some background music? You don't mind, just some background music? I'm going to do the meditation. Thank you. Every other Sunday. <clears throat> so as we come together, and as the lights are dimmed, we start to understand and feel who we are. We are children. We are one with the source of all creation. You are in this very moment as you open your heart and your mind, feeling yourself, feeling yourself as love, feeling yourself as wisdom, feeling yourself as substance or the energy in the universe that you can manage. And knowing that whatever happens to you is part of being in the spiritual experience, in this human experience. And as such, we can understand that is an illusion. That what we can do is take any issue, any situation, any person, any relationship, and as we really look at it, we can conclude that we are truly one. So take a moment. Maybe there's a situation in your life like Jill experienced. Different people, different words, different feelings, different emotions. But they're there. And so maybe you're estranged from a loved one, from a child, from a mother or father. Let yourself feel that as you are in the silence. And as you feel whatever you're feeling, bring it back to this space and this time. Embrace whatever you're feeling. Love whatever you're feeling. And see that feeling begin to wane, begin to release you. As you step into the understanding that each and every event in your life is an opportunity to heal, an opportunity to know oneness, an opportunity to honor who and what you are. You are beautiful. Life is beautiful. Let go of the Lucy's and say amen to light. And so it is. Amen. Amen.
Love is My Decision is another familiar tune, and the office angels have had slides made so that everybody can sing along, and because it is relative, thank you, is relatively repetitious, so you could probably be singing along by the end anyway. So just please join in as you feel moved. So please take your ties and offerings in your hand, place them over your heart, or say, as we say together, our offertory blessing. Divine love, through me, blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, God. And will the ushers please come forward? Now our offertory song, When We Give.
So now please join me in blessing the offerings. We are grateful for these tithes and offerings. We bless them and send them forth to do their great and mighty work. Amen. And now please join me in our youth prayer. Is that what's up? Okay, there we go. We now open our hearts to the children and families seeking a welcoming spiritual community filled with light and love. And so it is. And so do we have children today? And the light has a light has a light. We are walking. So would somebody like to explain what's going on? <laughs> what's your superpower? I play with kids. Yay. Very inclusive. We talked about our superpowers today. And what makes us really awesome. And everyone came up with a superpower. And she realized that she's very inclusive and is really good at finding all the kids that want to play on the playground. Yeah. I firebend. <laughs> Linnea is a good dancer. Atlas is a really good friend. He's also very inclusive. Yeah, show them what you guys made. Beautiful, thank you. So please join me in our blessing for the youth ed. Children and youth at department, we love you, we bless you, we appreciate you, and we behold the Christ you are. So please join your families, or if you can. <laughs> Now we have a special song that we want to sing for Richard. So please join us. I think hopefully the words are there until we meet again. <laughs> Blessing, Reverend Richard, for us with our unity blessing. Reverend Richard, we love you, we bless you, we appreciate you, and we behold the Christ you are. Yay. Yay. So now our time for our peace song. So.
prayer for protection. The light of God surrounds us. I am light. The love of God enfolds us. I am love. The power of God protects us. I am power. And the presence of God watches over us. I am presence. Wherever we are, God is, and all is well. It is. Thank you. Folks, folks, um, Richard will be downstairs to greet folks, um, so he won't be here at the, at the doorway today. So come on downstairs and join us. Thank you.